All right, well, let's get started with our scenario, EV4 Alert 5. Um, the goals we're gonna have is we're gonna have our MiG flights, if you remember from our pre-video, our MiG-17s we've outloaded with um, runway dribblers. They're gonna take off from this airfield, they're gonna come down here, eventually bomb Refitum, uh, air, or the airfield at Refitum, and then they come back up here and then sort of make their way back. Uh, I did sort of um, make one error during the introductory video. I believe I said you could have up to five waypoints in your plat, uh, your rating plan. You can actually have up to six. I was off by one. And of course, normally you would not have your rating um, plan plotted out here on the map like this. I'm just doing this because it's a, it's a tutorial, it's a solo game, so it's easier for me to keep track of it. And I don't need to uh, mark up a bunch of other paper when I can just do this pretty easily. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of why it's like that. Um, also, if you remember, if you do bombing runs, you have to uh, label the combat speed and height changes you're going to make. So it's going to be medium, medium, medium. We're going to come down to low here because I'm going to dive bomb on Refitum. And then we're just going to basically use dash to get out and maybe combat so we can actually land because you can't dash speed and land at the same time. Um, okay, so once again, going to try to do this tutorial, going to try to explain things. Definitely going to screw things up. Definitely going to be taking down with the rule books for things that I don't quite remember. Um, this game is a fairly... It's not complex in the individual parts. It becomes much more complex when you're trying to put all those parts together. There is a lot of procedural stuff. Lots of detailed levels that it can go into. Uh, this tutorial, we will not be doing that too much because all I really have to do is roll for flak. Uh, deal with air combat and uh, air to ground attacks, which is which is a good part of the game. That is the majority of it um, But there is a lot to the SAM game uh, putting your SAM sites down detecting with SAMs firing with SAMs trying to avoid SAMs uh, Rolling for all of that. So there's a little bit that we will not be dealing with in the tutorial um, They're just gonna have to be something you deal with on a larger raid scenario and maybe if I play one of the bigger ones next we could get some SAMs on there, but the SAMs do up the, the level of procedurality and things you have to do by, by a significant factor. So um, they even have a few dedicated phases for them <laughs> here in the sequence of play. So I'll just go ahead and review the sequence of play before we start launching into it. Um, because this is sort of an easier scenario, we don't have to do all the phases. So we have, first thing you do is random events, but you avoid that the first turn. Then you have the jamming phase. This is when the Israeli Air Force uh, can use its various standoff jammers or planes with jamming capability. You can uh, change those around or decide what you want to do with your jamming. The third is the detection phase. Both sides have a sort of detection level. For this scenario, the Israelis have a detection level of C. The Egyptians have a detection level of D. And so you get one sort of shot at every turn to get a free detection on things in the air. Then we move into the movement phase in which you will draw initiative chits. Um, this is when SAMs could attack you, it's when you can do bombing runs, this is where the majority of the action goes on is in the movement phase. Then we'll have the fuel phase in which you note uh, the fuel cost for if you use dash throttle or if you engage in air-to-air -air combat. There is a SAM location phase for the Israeli player only. If there are SAMs on the board, there's a chance for them to potentially uh, find ones that have either just fired or, or on the ground. And then there's the admin phase, which is a catch-all for lots and lots of different things. It's a lot of cleanup. It's rolling for various effects. Um, you can also create dummy counters there for or flights that have not been visually identified. So lots of little things you can do there. We'll talk about them as we get to them. Just know that the admin phase is where you do a lot of those sort of uh, upkeep tasks, right? Bookkeeping things. Okay, so let's get started. We're going to just um, start rolling through the sequence of play. So there are no random events. There is no jamming phase. There is a detection phase, but nothing is um, detected yet because nothing's been ready to move yet, right? So we go to the movement phase. Now, as the defender, the Israeli can choose to move first or second. Now, it's going to not get to move at all because it has no planes uh, ready to move. The scenario rules say that the Israeli player cannot take off until they detect an Egyptian flight or until an Egyptian flight enters uh, into the Sinai area. So it doesn't really get to choose. Normally it would, it doesn't yet. So it automatically defers back to the is, uh, Egyptian player. Um, this is where you would draw out of your chit cut. But since we literally only have one flight to move, there's not multiple flights, the, the chits really mean uh, very little, but for, just for you know giggles, I drew a two. So that means I can move two of my flights and then it would pass the Israeli player, they would draw a chit and decide, and that would show how many they could move. You do that back and forth until one side's moved all of its planes and then the other side can just free move all the rest of them, right? You don't have to keep drawing shits. 
So because of the way we're gonna do this, we're gonna kind of do a scattered takeoff here from uh, Kibrit. And I think we'll start with uh, the K flight. So we're gonna have it on its undetected side. And a takeoff takes three turns. The very first turn, you literally place it on the airfield. The second turn, it can move half of its MP. And the third turn, it can move the full allotments. Let me actually get these out of the way. It also starts on the deck. Okay. So now there's a movement phase, but we literally are just doing that because to take off, you just place it on the airfield. We haven't used any combat throttle or air-to-air -air, uh, combat, so we're not going to use any fuel. There is no SAM location phase. And the admin phase, there's nothing really we need to do for it right now, so we just move on to the next one. So now we roll for random events because it's past the first turn, so now battlefield chaos can ensue. All right, we roll a 15. 15 is a mechanical failure. Roll 1d10 again. We roll a 3, so it applies to the Egyptian player. If there's a damaged aircraft, that aircraft becomes crippled. If there's a crippled, it crashes. <laughs> um, so we don't have any damaged or crippled flights, so we're actually okay with that. So that random event doesn't do much. Now we go to the detection phase. So we do have a flight on that has been taxed down the runway. It's, it's taking off, right? Because every turn is a minute. So it seems like a lot, lot, more, lot more is going on. Really, it's, it's a very short time span. So this flight's probably been taxed down the runway and it's gathering speed and taking off. And the Israelis now have a chance to actually detect it. So their detection level is C. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna roll 2d10 and we're going to consult the detection table, as you can see right here. And for C level, we need to get, what is that, 12 or higher to detect that flight. It's not identified, just detected. And we also get modifiers. I keep forgetting this, oh man. So you can see there's a bunch of modifiers down there. So let's take a look at what we have here. Uh, the target is on the deck, that is true. So it's a minus three. It's not night. Uh, and we don't have visual sighting. We just have to do modifiers for flights because that's only for visual, the other ones. So we get a minus three to this roll. And we roll a nine, so it's not detected. Um, and the Israelis haven't launched anything, so we won't have to any detection for the Egyptians. So we move on to the movement phase. Uh, again, we would draw chits out of the cup, but since there's literally only one flight, we can uh, eschew that, or I, I think that's how you say that word, and uh, just have it just do its normal thing. This is a flight that is laden because it's air to ground uh, ordnance. So it has reduced movement because it's laden. And this is a MiG-17, so right now it's at the deck level. That also counts as low. And for a laden flight, you only get two movement points. Now, since we just took off, we only get half our movement for this uh, next movement phase. So we only get one movement point uh, to do anything. And since we dictated the fact that we have to be at medium and taking off, we're gonna use one movement point to actually jump from uh, the deck to low. And this will count as climb, so it climbed a little bit. It climbed one thing, it's at now low. Um, okay, perfect. So we look at the rest of our phases. No fuel, no SAM, no admin. We're done. Next turn. Random events. It's a seven. I believe we do take that event. Dust double. A localized dust storm creates haze on the deck. Roll 1d10 again. At 1 to 8, the EF or the Egyptian player places the haze counter anywhere on the map except in urban and water hexes. Uh, haze affects that hex and all adjacent hexes. And a 9 10, the IF places a haze counter. If there's already haze on deck, remove the haze counter. So this is like a little. And the Egyptian player can place a haze marker. Let's see where I have those, because I need to look and see. And that's going to be funny because I actually don't know the rules for haze. I'm going to have to look those up as we get to them. And I, there we go. I can place them anywhere I want. And I think what we're going to do is we'll go ahead and place the... Fuck, what does haze do? <laughs> oh, man, I didn't think about that one. That's, gonna, that's, a, that's a curveball, as they say. Haze, 22, 22.2 is probably what we want. 22.2 is probably what we want. If haze is in effect, a haze layer extends from the deck up to the highest band indicated. Flights are in haze if they are flying at these altitudes. <coughs> Pardon me. They affect engagement rules and um, various other attacks. Let's see how it looks at it affects engagement rules. 
think it's just going to be a modifier. Yeah, it's just a modifier. So if we get engaged, then yeah, it's going to be it's tougher to get engaged. So I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and um, go ahead and place this haze on the deck here at a uh, and refine them. It's going to give all those things there. It's going to put a nice little hazy dust storm over it. I mean, is that good for me? Um, it doesn't really say it was good for me. Let's take a look at the engagement rolls and see what kind of thing we're gonna get there. If the target's in haze, yeah, then it's just minus one. It's actually perfect, because so we may not want to be engaged. I guess I could put it anywhere over here. That'd be kind of fun, wouldn't it? But um, let's actually put it over here. Because I don't want to be engaged when I'm leaving, so that'd be kind of fun to kind of have that haze there. So we'll keep the haze there. Okay. We don't have a jamming phase. We do a detection phase um, to see if this flight gets detected. We get a minus three. Actually, it's not on the deck anymore, is it? So actually, we don't get that minus three anymore. Nope. So now we just got to roll a 12 or higher. We roll a two. That does not count. So he stays undetected. And now he can move his full movement, which is three when he's laden. So we're going to spend one more uh, movement to go to medium. And then we're going to spend our other two going one, two here. All right. I wonder if I should have kept this at low, but they go so much, so much slower, slower low. That's why I didn't do it that way. Okay, so he's going to go up there. I believe he counts as having zoom climbed now because we've had to go through two levels we went through. You start off at deck, and then you go to low, and then went to medium, so it's two levels up. That probably will impact him negatively for lots of rolls, but we'll see about that. Uh, and then, of course, our other flight can take off now. So it's going to begin, right? So it does that. Remember, we would be drawing shit card or chits here, but uh, there's no Israeli uh, ability to fly, so technically the Egyptian player will always get to move. Um... So yeah, this guy now can be detected next turn. He wasn't ready to be detected that turn, though, so he stays there. And that's it, I believe we do, right? We got a fuel phase, Sam, and admin, so we're good. Back to the next turn. So now we're going on turn... Well, this has got to be, what, three, four? I should probably be keeping track of that. And we roll a 12. A 12 is fuel starvation. And this only affects uh, if we have crippled or damaged aircraft, and we don't have either for either side. So now we go to detection phase again. So let's try to get this guy. He's on the deck. I need to be actually marking that. So we get a minus three. Let's try to check that Y flight. We do not. And let's see if we can get this uh, medium flight here. Ooh, we do detect it. Okay. So there we go. That's actually big. Detected flights are much easier to engage. And you get, I think, better rolls for visual sighting as well. I'm not sure. I just, I do know that it's easier to engage a detected flight. Um, now that it's detected, though, we can actually launch an aircraft on our turn for movement. So we go to movement, and as a defender, the Israeli can choose to go first or second. And I think this time they will. It doesn't really matter because they're taking off, but we'll go ahead and just say first. And you have to take off on the axis of your aircraft or your airfield here. So we're going to put him this way. And he's on the ground now. Okay. Um, the next turn the Egyptians can roll to see if they detect it, so we'll see how that goes. And of course he is on the deck, so let's get him the deck marker too. Great, so then we go to the fuel phase, nothing to do there, Sam, nothing to do, admin, again, very simplified. We're, we only have a few aircraft on the board, we don't have a lot of other markers going on. Um, if you were playing face-to-face, -face, would, you would definitely be using dummy flights. Uh, the scenario rules need to specify that you could split this flight into two if you want. Um, and have to, uh, basically uh, two planes in each flight. Right now it has four. And uh, you could also be generating dummy counters that go everywhere. These guys could have been generating dummy counters that start moving different places. Um, only the ones that are real uh, have to adhere to the flight path you had. The dummy counters don't, uh, as far as I remember. I think dummies can kind of do whatever they want. I might have to look that up. I'm not totally positive. Once you are visually sighted, though, you can no longer make dummies. So that's kind of one thing about being visually sighted, and you will. Oh, and once you are visually sighted, you stay visually sighted. You can become undetected, right, uh, and, but still be visually sighted. Essentially, they know there's a flight coming, they just don't know what kind of planes are coming at them. Okay, so Israelis went first. Uh, technically, 
technically the Israelis went first, so they should have drawn a chit. Because, as happens here, you can't draw zero chit, so technically he doesn't even get to move. It would now pass back over to the Egyptians. They would draw a chit. And they draw two, so they get to move both their flights. And then the Israelis, because the Egyptians will have moved all their flights, the Israelis will get to move their flight no matter what. So this guy's at full speed, he's at three, so he gets to move three at medium, that's nice. So what he's gonna do is go one, two, at a speed of three, I get a free turn of 60 degrees, anytime I move or climb or do any of that fun stuff. So we had one, two, he's gonna go, first he's like that, so he turns to that one, he turns to that one, that becomes a 60 degree turn, and then we move one more and that's three. This guy gets to move half, Remember, he has two points, but he only gets to move half of them because it's his first turn. So he's going to take that time, and he's going to climb to medium. This guy's already at medium, but he's at low, or he's at dex, so and now he goes to low. And that's his one point. Now the Egyptians would get to move, and what they're going to do is take, uh, they get to move half their movement, right? So I'm not really, I looked up rules to see what laden was for... If you have air-to-air -air weapons, if you're considered laden, I know you're considered laden if you have air-to-ground or fuel tanks. I did not see anything about air-to-air -air weapons making you laden. I could be totally wrong on this, and I think other people that play downtown or elusive victory can chime in and let me know when I'm messing up. If I did mess this up, I'm going to rule them as clean. Um, that does affect their maneuver ratings and everything to a positive degree. Uh, if someone else wants to let me know that they're laden, if you have air-to-air -air weapons, that'd be great. I sort of can't find it in the rule book uh, through my quick flipping, so I'm going to have to do more detailed books later. We're just going to rule them as clean here. So he gets to move half of his movement. Oh, wait, actually, he just uh, he just got placed on there, didn't he? Oh, no, he was detected that turn, so he actually got to move. So this is actually his second turn. I need to be better. I need to track this better. <laughs> this is something that if you played with somebody, they would definitely be tracking, like, whether that was your first turn placement or not. I'm, because I'm trying to run so many rules in my head right now, uh, because I'm unfamiliar with this game in a lot of ways, uh, I'm going to screw things up. So this might be a screw up here. But I think I can move half since I've already done my one turn of placing him. As a clean person at combat throttle, because we're not going to go dash, uh, he gets four movement points at all levels, at low, medium, and high. So he's at the deck that's considered low. So he gets four points, and he can only use two of them now. So what he's going to do is he's going to climb to low. And then he's uh, that's all he's going to do, and he's actually going to move. So we're going to move one. So he moved one and climbed to low. Everybody's moved, we didn't use any fuel, there's no SAMs, and there's no admin. Back to random events. Next turn. 12. Again, fuel starvation, that does not apply. Uh, let's go to detection phase. So let's see if the Israelis can detect this guy. He's no longer on the deck, and they do detect him, so he's detected even. Let's see if the Egyptians can detect this flight. Ooh, that might be enough. They roll a 15. I believe that's just enough even for their uh, not so great. Yep, 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 that definitely detects it. So this flight's been detected. Okay. So now we go to the movement phase, and I think the Israelis will opt to move first. And they roll, come into the chip thing, and they pull out their chip. We're using a small amount of flights. So they got a zero there. So they don't get to move, that means we go to the Egyptians now. And they pull out a one, so they can move one flight. And I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and just move this guy, because he's, uh... uh... It doesn't really matter, I don't I mean, they're not that close yet, so uh, deciding who moves when is, is, is academic right now. It'll become more important as we get closer to these uh, flights, and maybe we can zoom past them or whatnot. Anyway. So he's at his medium height, he's at combat throttle, we're going to use all three movement, and he's just going to go straight up through hexes. One, two, three. Now we go back to the Israeli player, let's see if he can actually move. He does, he gets a two, so now we don't have to draw chits anymore because there's only one flight after this one. And he gets to move his full value now, which is four. So he's actually going to turn for his first movement. And I believe since he has a speed of four, his max turn 
is 120 degrees, so that's actually really good for us. So he's going to go 30, 60, and actually that's enough. He only needs to go 60. And that's one movement, so he has three movement points left, and we're just going to zoom out. Actually, we're going to climb one and go to medium. That leaves us two points left, and we'll go one, two. And he'll just come up here. Okay. Oops, stay there, black. Okay. Now play passes back to the Egyptian player because he has one flight that hasn't moved. Um, he now can move his full movements, which is going to be three. So he's also going to spend one more movement to climb to medium. And then go one, two. So he's good to go. All right, and that guy's still medium too. He's at medium height. Okay, so that's the end of that. We don't have any fuel or sand location or admin phase. So we move back on to random events. We get a 15. Mechanical failure. Nobody's damaged or crippled, so that does not apply. Uh, we'll go to movement. Again, the Israelis will elect to go first. And they draw a one shit. So that's perfect. And what they're going to do is just try to go get this guy. So we're going to use our uh, combat throttle. We got four. I don't think what he's going to do is just go one, two, three. He gets a free turn of 60 degrees. And he says, now I will make him go that way. And he'll go four. Uh, you can sort of straddle hexes, right, because of the way you can face each, uh, either side or angle. So, yeah, he's doing that. And that's his four movement. Now we will have the Egyptians go. They literally can move both their aircraft because the Israelis have no other aircraft to move. We have to stick to our flight, pan flight plan until we either get attacked or something happens, and then we can sort of deviate uh, freely as needed. So he's still got to keep going here. He's got to do what he's got to do. So he's going to use his three movement. And he's going to go one, two, three. And because he used three movement, he gets a free turn of 60 degrees. So he's going to go one, two. So now he's got his he's got his thing going on right here, right? Um, yeah, I think this Israeli flight is going to get some, get some nice attacks next turn. And then this guy can move three. So he's going to go one, two. He gets a free turn of 60. One, two, three. So yeah, he comes down here. And next turn, I think we're going to see some combat. That'll be interesting. Okay, so nobody used any fuel. There's no sand, no admin. I'm going to keep saying that just because sequence of play is important, and I don't want people to think that I'm... Uh, I do have... Sometimes when I do these videos, I forget sequence of play. So it happens. Okay, we move to the next turn. Random events. Ooh, rolled a 17 there. Israeli fighting spirit. The Israeli player may elect to go first if the scenario attacker, well he's not, he's the defender, or the IAF player may skip the chip pull and automatically move one flight before any chip pull for the game turn. So actually we will do that because he could draw a zero uh, and then this guy would be able to kind of move past him maybe, um, which would be not good for the Israeli flight. So I think what they're going to do is automatically take their one chip pull and we're going to go get this sucker. So here's what we do. We have what, four movement, we're at medium. So what we do is we're going to go one, we get a free turn. At a movement speed of four, you get a free turn of 60. I turn 30 degrees, so that's easy. One, and that's a free one. So then we're going to go two, and now we're going to attempt to engage. Engaging uses all of your movement points for that turn, for both flights, I believe. Let me actually double check on that. Engagement. Detection, air to air combat. All right. We could maybe see if we can get a visual sighting on this guy. So let's take a look at visual sighting. Detection. Do, do, do. Uh, okay, so actually we don't get to do a visual sighting here, although I think once we get into air care combat, it automatically, they automatically get visualized because you see what you're fighting. Uh, during the detection phase, if a flight was within 
four hexes and the line of sight of a unit, you could try a visual ID roll. Um, unfortunately, the scenario rule said that the line of sight is two hexes for this combat, so back then the, that plane couldn't have done a, a visual sighting roll. Uh, and also, visual sighting does not equal detection, right? Just because you know what kind of planes they are does not necessarily mean you know exactly what type of where it's at exactly. So that's one of the confusing things about this game. Obviously, we have to have counters that show the states at all times. But in the game, there is a difference between detected, undetected, and difference between being detected and not visually identified, such as these guys, but also being visually identified and not detected, which can also happen. All right, so we've got that. If a flight enters air to air combat, um, it automatically becomes ID'd. So that's kind of the nice thing there. All right, so the prerequisites for an attack. The attacker must have an air to air weapon, we do. The defender must be detected, they are. The defender must be within one hex of the attacker and in the same altitude band or the band immediately below. We are at the same or one immediately below. If in different hexes, the attacker must be have the defender in his forward arc. We do have him in our forward arc. I could just move on top of him, but we're in the forward arc right here. And the attacker must not be disordered, aborted, or performed SAM avoidance or declared anti-radar tactics in the current turn. So we've done all that, and the attacker and defender make separate engagement rolls. And the engagement value used for the roll is shown on the table and is based on the detection status of the enemy flight, whether it's day or night. And um, if there's no line of sight to the target, you have to use night values. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna roll on the engagement chart now. Let's find our engagement chart. It's pretty easy. <laughs> um, there it is. So it's daytime. So we need to, for detective flight, we need to roll a nine or higher on 2d10 and we have modifiers of aggression value. If the flight is disordered or in close formation and all these different things. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to engage. We have to roll, it's a detective flight. So we need to, do they both roll engagement? They do both roll engagement, all right. Yeah, because they both do. We'll see if they can, if they both engage. So they're both detected, that's helpful for both sides. Let's go ahead and do the Israeli roll first. So the modifiers are we get to add the aggression value of our flight. And if you remember in the pre-flight sequence, we calculated our aggression values and our Israeli fly, uh, pilot has a plus two. So he gets a plus two to his roll. Uh, he also gets, let's see, nothing else. So no other modifiers apply. So we get to roll, we get to add plus two. Wow, he rolls a 10 plus two is 12. That is engaged. So let's see about the other flights. The Israeli flight successfully engages that. Let's see if the defender successfully engages the Israeli. His aggression value for the K flight, because we had to note this earlier, the K flight has an aggression value of zero, which is nice because the other one has an aggression value of minus one. So we just roll this and see no modifiers and we also engage. So the attacker and defender both engage, combat commences, but there's no surprise or disadvantage. Move the attacking flight to the defender's altitude band. So we didn't get a, we didn't get a surprise on him, so we're basically equal. And now we move into combat. So let's go a little closer. Now we've engaged successfully. Now I believe we roll for maneuver. Let me make sure. Yep. Okay, engagement only uses all the attacking flights MP. Um, that was my bad. So now each flight rolls two dice for maneuver. We're going to look at the maneuver table. Let's see if I can get this in there. Yeah, that works. So the maneuver table, we're going to roll on the table using the column for the number of aircraft and the flight. Um, the Israelis have four flights, so they get to use that four column you can see there. The uh, Egyptians, because we're using Soviet doctrine, this is pre-1973, um, so we have to automatically use the two column, because even though we have four aircraft, the most you can ever get with Soviet doctrine is being in the two column. So we have a lot of different modifiers here that's really important. We have the maneuver differential, we have an aggression differential, um, we have geometry, these kind of things. If the enemy is disordered, close, flight of surprise, flight of advantage, disengaging, and takes at night. So most of these we don't have to worry about because actually it's not surprised or disadvantaged. It's not in a close formation. They're not disordered. 
The main things we have to worry about is maneuver differential, aggression differential, and geometry. So let's go ahead and calculate our DRMs here for the attacker. So the maneuver differential for the Mirage versus the um, MiG-17, let's take a look here. We go to our little aircraft data chart, doo -doo -doo -doo, and you can see here we got the maneuver values on the far right there, combat dash and maneuver, not the far, far right, but where all those numbers are, you can see. Um, maneuver, we're at medium, and we have the Mirage 3 CJ. So what does that mean? We get to do, that's a six, we have a six value. So we get to modify this, we get to modify it plus. Um, so our differential here, we have a maneuver rating of six, right, because we're at, we're clean, so we have a maneuver rating of six. We're attacking a MiG-17 that has a maneuver rating of two because he's laden and he's at medium height. So it's a plus four automatically for our roll. So let's go ahead and write this down because I don't want to forget. Um, Left-handed for the win. So we have plus four for that. The aggression differential is going to just be plus two because our pilot, the Israeli pilot, is uh, much more aggressive. And we get a geometry because we are in... No, we're all facing forward, so we don't get any geometry. We're both facing head-on. If we were attacking it from the rear, we would get a nice little bonus to our roll. So we're going to use the four column here on the dice on this uh, maneuver table. We get a modifier of plus six uh, to our roll. And we roll a 14, so we get a 20. That means we get five shots. This could be very bad for the old, uh, the old uh, Egyptian flights here. Let's go ahead and note that. So we'll say he has five shots. How many shots will the um, will the good old uh, Meg get? And remember, it only has guns. It can't use its uh, ordnance. And I'm not going to abandon my ordnance to get clean maneuver ratings because honestly, I need that to attack the airfield. Maybe I should dump it and then have him run and have the other guy come attack. But we're just going to do a straight on brute force attack here. So what are our modifiers? Well, again, we have to do the maneuver differential, and this is going to be bad for us. It's going to be negative four, right? Because we have to basically take those modifiers the other way. And then it's going to be a negative two because they have a much better aggression rating. So we roll and, and subtract six. And we roll an 11. 11 minus six is five. And that means we get zero shots back. So we're basically just going to get really hit here. <laughs> So now we're going to go to shot resolution. Let me, love, let me double check this. Yep, yep, yep. Select air to air weapon to shoot with and roll two dice with modifiers and consult the shot resolution table. Roll one, for, roll one die for every flight that took a shot and then we'll check for depletion in a minute. So okay, so that's what we're going to do. It's pretty easy, I guess. So the undepleted weapon we're going to use on our on this attacking flight, I think we'll use our infrared missiles, the Shafir. The reason is I don't think they even get a modifier. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, what's our combat value of the Shafir? I believe it's really low. Yeah, it's a zero for the Shafir. Because these are early weapons. Shafir and the Matra, the both of them that we're carrying, just have zero values. They're just not uh, very effective at, at fighting. These are sort of early weapons they're using here. So we'll go ahead and use our Shafir missile just for fun. And what we're going to do is we're going to, yeah, attacker shots are resolved first, then the defender, and a shot may be refused based on the results of an earlier shot. Because the more you fire, the higher chance you'll have of depleting your weapon. Um, so we don't have any modifiers because modifiers are either combat value of the selected weapon, and we also get plus one if the flight has an additional undepleted weapon. So I guess we do have an additional undepleted weapon on the Mirage because we have our two different kinds of missiles and neither are depleted. And we guess we also have a uh, guns. I wonder if that counts as a weapon too. Okay, so we're gonna roll two D10. We've got no modifiers really going into it. I guess we have plus one because we have additional un unused weapons. So let's see what we get here for the roll. I roll a three. <laughs> All right, so our first shot, we roll a three and get a plus one. We get no effect. Let's go ahead and keep track of our shots here. So we have one shot, no effect. All right, second shot coming up. Roll a seven plus one, also no effect. Oh, 
Oops, I misrolled that one. Oh man, getting really bad rolls here. Five plus one, no effect. So man, we're not, not doing so hot here. We've got eight plus one. Wow, we are just not getting it. So we have one last shot to use of our... And we get a 12, we get a 13, wow. No effect, no effect, no effect. So we used all five of our shots. We had no effect on anything. So that was, wow. You would have thought the Israelis could have gotten at least something damaged, but uh, really didn't do it. So now we roll a die for every flight that took a shot, subtracting one for every shot beyond the first, and we check the depletion chart. So our depletion number for this weapon is six. So we need to roll, uh, I believe we roll 1d10. Yeah, we roll a 1d10, and we're going to take minus 1 for every shot beyond the first. So we actually get minus 4 on our roll here. 9 minus 4 is 5, and unfortunately that is just enough to deplete that weapon. So yeah, we have lost all of our Shafir missiles. We're actually, um, so what we'll do is we'll come here and mark them out. We'll just sort of scratch them out and be like, it's done. Wow, that flight threw a lot of missiles at them and they just somehow really got um, lucky there. So we are out of Shafir missiles. Still have other missiles, but we're running out quickly. Well, we didn't get any hits. Um, oh wait, you know what's honestly, well, I don't think it would have mattered really. So technically what I forgot to do is that you should decrease a flight's maneuver rating by one if it climbed a movement by two if it zoom climbed, and these guys did zoom climb, so their maneuver rating just is crud. But the maneuver rating really only affects um, how many shots you can get and also your engagement, right? So we knew this was going to get engaged, and there was no way that um, this guy was going to get more than five shots. I think he rolled like the best he could get. We could have taken less shots. We easily could have just fired two rounds off and not, but we had such good ability to hit that you just really want to use everything you got there. So that was that was unfortunate there. That was not what you want to see. Since we didn't land any hits, we don't really have to do any um, damage. So here's what we do after combat. We need to check for the following. Morale and MIG panics. We do a scatter. We place maneuver markers and can become undetected because when flights sort of collide in the radar like this, it just becomes a big fuzzy dots and you don't really know what's going on. It's going to take a little bit longer to detect the flights again. So we attempt to... Rec uh, let's see. We can do disordered state. Let's take a look here. I need to actually... I didn't take super good notes on this. I should have actually probably taken a little bit better notes on this. Right, so let's take a look at it together. Let's do it together. Okay. So the first thing you do is a morale check. All attacking and defending flights in air-to-air -air combat roll a morale check after combat has been resolved, even if no shots occurred by either side. Um, flights that take damage or losses from AAA, fire cans, or the, any SAMs also make a morale check. To make a morale check, we're going to roll two die and consult the morale check table. Let's find out where this morale check table is. Oh, there it is. All right, it's morale check. So we did air-to-air -air combat. We're going to roll two die and apply modifiers, which include the aggression value if we had surprise or disadvantaged. Um, so none of those really modifiers apply except for the aggression value. And so this was air-to-air -air combat. Yeah, okay, so let's see. Let's do a morale check. Oops, I hit that with my foot again. Sorry. We're gonna roll two and we're gonna add Really? We're gonna to add to that because of our aggression value? Oh I guess so maybe. I don't know. Hmm. Hold on, I need to look this up. This is interesting. Alright, screen so morale check. I rolled an 11. I get modifiers of plus my flight's aggression value. So his was plus two, so that's a 13. A nine to 13 in air to air combat. So what does that mean? Hold on. Oh, it was, it was air to air. What does that mean though? 
Uh, okay, so this is where I'm gonna get a slowdown because I'm trying to figure out what this means. Apply damage loss average only for aircraft damage or loss and adjust result of combat. Refer to the column for air combat or SAM as appropriate. Apply the results. Okay, so rule 13. Um, our aggression value goes down by one and we are disordered. Okay. So we go to our chart and we say, okay, this flight did have an aggression value of plus two. It now goes down to plus one. Now we do it for the other aircraft. And what we're going to do... Okay. So now we're going to do the morale check for the defender. Yeah. So let's go ahead and roll this for the defender. And he rolls an 11, and his aggression value is zero. So for an 11, he also gets a minus one of his aggression and also becomes disordered. So let me see if I can find another disordered marker. All right, so we're gonna mark his aggression down since I got the sheet right here. His, his aggression now becomes negative one. And he gets a disordered marker. Let's see if I can find those. Oh, there it is. Nice. All right. So now that we have disordered markers, let's talk about what disordered means. Flights that become disordered are noted as such on the flight log sheet. Optionally, you can mark it with a disordered marker, and we'll just we'll keep the markers out. There's just so few flights, I can keep track of it. Uh, disordered flights cannot enter defensive wheels and immediately leave on becoming disordered. Okay. They may not visually sight, radar search, initiate air-to-air -air combat, or make air-to-ground attacks. Ooh, that's bad. Modifiers apply to engagement and air-to-air -air combat, of course. Flights can recover from disorder in the admin phase. Disorder flights roll two dice and add their aggression value. Modify the roll by plus eight if you're in or adjacent to a rally point or orbit point hex. We didn't do a rally point hex here, uh, so that's not going to help. And on a roll of 20 or more, remove the disordered status. So essentially, we'd have to roll a 20 to get this MiG back on track. Actually, we can't even roll a 20. It, this flight is done. It will never, ever become not disordered. Um, because it would have to roll a 20. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So technically, I don't think he'll ever be able to not be disordered, so he can't do air-to-ground attacks. So this effectively makes this flight um, done. So, And because it was attacked, it no longer has to keep up with all this. So essentially what we're going to do is this flight's going to now have to go home. It doesn't have any ability to do anything. I can't get it out of disordered state. Um, at least from my read, I can't. On a 20 or more, remove the disordered status. Yeah, and we're not going to get a 20 or more because his aggression level is minus 1. And we don't have a rally uh, point. I didn't plot a rally point. I guess I could, but we'll just say I did in this turn. Rally points have to be done on very specific geographical locations. Um, since I'm mentioning rally points, let's go ahead and just look up that rule real quick. Any point five So I should have done this. I could have done one for each raid. So rally points may be plotted in any hex containing rough or urban terrain or part of a river. Unfortunately, um, yeah, I didn't plot one. I should have done one. And they must be 10 hexes from the tar raid target hex, and this may eliminate a friendly open field. Okay. So yeah, he would have to be 10 hexes away from Refitum. So that would be what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So yeah, anything over here. It basically would have to be like, a rough hex over here or back to the river if I wanted to do that. Um, what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and keep this flight going because I didn't plot a, plot a rally point. I'm not going to do alter that now. Um, honestly, you should. And because this flight's now disordered and it's not going to be able to keep the combat going. The only positive benefit is that our flight here... Oh yeah, also these were detected. When you go... Okay, so K, okay, yeah, he's the hard guy. Forgot that. When you go to air or combat, you become visually sighted, right? And you, once you're visually sighted, you always stay visually sighted. But you may become undetected, which these flights will be. So now we've got those appropriate markers done. Let's go ahead and flip these guys to their undetected side. 
And yeah, so that's that's the end of that. So, okay. So we did our morale check. Talk about disordered. Now there's a chance there's a MIG panic. Any air-to-air -air attack on a flight tasked with bombing, roll one die for each bombing task flight in the same mission. On a roll of one or less, the flight that flight jettisons its ordinance. Subtract one if in close formation with the flight that was just attacked. Well, it's not. So we're gonna have to roll a one or less to have him drop his bombs. He does not, and in the same mission. So I guess it even applies to this guy. And he does not, oof, he barely avoids dropping his bombs. He holds out, doesn't panic. And then after air combat, flights scatter from their hex, roll a die for each flight in the combat and follow instructions in the scattered diagrams. If instructed to descend an altitude band and the flights on the deck, you, you don't go any further. Um, after scattering flights, you mark them all with maneuver markers. And maneuver markers just take MP the next phase to get rid of. It just eats up maneuver, it eats up points for you. So we'll go ahead and do that real quick. Just go ahead and give them also a maneuver marker and a maneuver marker. Oops, that's upside down. Okay, now let's take a look at scatter charts. So for scatter here, you're following air to air, you roll one die for scatter, turn and move flights into the indicated hex, flights and defensive wheels don't scatter, and if the roll is odd, the flight descends an altitude band, if it's even, there's no further effect. So, yeah. In the indicated hex. So why would you not use that one? Why would you use this one? Following air to air, roll one die for scatter, turn and move flights. In the Oh, I see. This is probably a turn and then the movement, right? No, that is black. Okay, we're going to look this up. <laughs> Man, just when you first play a game, you just really learn all the things you don't know. Okay, well, it doesn't say. I don't know why there's two charts on there. I don't know why there's two charts on here. I don't know why. It doesn't explain it. The rules say nothing about it. Um, that's weird. Turn and move flights into the end. I don't understand why there's two charts here. Is one the turn chart? No, <laughs> it doesn't say. I have issues with this rule book. I'll be really honest. I have lots and lots and lots of issues with this rule book. I don't think it's done very well. I think it's scatterbrained. I feel like it's, it just doesn't feel very tight or organized to be quite honest. It's not like the individual parts are difficult. It's just like, it's here it says check the scatter chart and then follow it. Um, follow the instructions in the scatter diagrams. There is no instructions in the scatter diagrams. It literally just says that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't get the difference between the two. I don't get it. I don't get this at all. I don't know which one you use. Do you only use the first one if you're the attacker and the second if you're the defender? That doesn't make any sense to me. Why doesn't it just say that? <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's, this is why I don't like this rule book. I'll be honest. I don't like the rule book. Um, the scenario book maybe answers this, because, but that's really not good if I have to consult the scenario book just to understand how this works. All right. I mean, I, I don't want to be doing this. I'm reading too much. This is taking too long. Um, and this play, and this... And the scenario, man, this is, you can just tell this is an older game, because this is the, this is the scenario playthrough book. It's just a, I mean, that's too much. That's so many words in a paragraph. It's just really clumped together. I don't know. It needs, it needs more illustrations. Obviously it was done just in a, a different period of GMT's production values. They've just gotten better at it, honestly. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to do with the scatter chart. This does not say, <laughs> it does not say at all. So we're just going to take a guess. We're just gonna guess. I don't really know. Um, 
That's really annoying. I'm gonna say that up front. That's really annoying to have this and to not have it clear. And, and honestly, I've had issues with the player aids too. Like there's some things on one of the player aids that you need to have on the other. It's for the Egyptians, I believe, that doesn't have it on the Israeli chart and you need to look at both to know what the abbreviations are. It's kind of a mess. Um, I don't know, I'm really paralyzed here. Well, we're just gonna use that first one. I have no idea what the second one's about. I have no idea. So we're just gonna use, I don't get it. So if, you, if you've played these games before, please enlighten me on that. I do not get it. Um, Roll one die for scatter, turn and move flights and indicate a text. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, anyway. Roll the Israeli flight, they roll a six. That means it moves to the top right hex using whatever the hell that is. It is um, evens, there's no more further effect. It doesn't descend, it just literally goes. Um... Maybe this first one's the turn and the second one is, but no, it just says roll one die. Maybe use the result for both. I guess you can't turn backwards, right? So yeah, that probably makes more sense. Okay, that needs to be clearly labeled. That really needs to be clearly labeled. That's that's unexcusable in a, in a sense, because that's really confusing. Now I'm just ranting. Anyway, so we'll say what he rolls six. So a six means he turns to his right. And he's gonna go to... Um... Yeah, but now he's not even facing. Oh, okay, I think I get it now. Look at the orientation, I'm getting this now. See that, see the first one on the left, it's him facing like a uh, pointed end, and the other one's him facing a flat end. I don't know why that was hard for me to grasp, but that also is just not super intuitive, I don't know. Maybe I'm just slow, maybe I'm dumb. Okay, so, which is totally possible. So he actually moves into this hex. He's just gonna scatter and go this way, into that one. And this guy is gonna move, he rolls a seven. And he's also doing a flat movement, so he's going to move uh, over to his right. So he's going to go over to here. I guess he turns and enters that hex, doesn't he? This guy doesn't have to turn at all, he just goes straight. Yeah. Okay, so there we go. Whew, okay. You know, first time through. And honestly, I described all about that, and I mean... It should be clearly labeled, I'm just dumb. And I mean, it probably is looking, and it, you know, I don't know. I don't know how you would ever fix that. Maybe that's just a gripe I had while I play. Yeah, it happens. Okay, so we've successfully done that combat. And so this flight, he's used all his movement. This guy can now do whatever the hell he wants, although we've determined that he will not be able to not be disordered. So yeah, so now we go to the Egyptian movement. Now, this guy has a movement marker on him, so let's take a look at what movement markers make you do. I believe you have to spend half of your MP to, to, to lose a movement marker, or a maneuver marker, sorry. Uh, let's see, okay. No, that's not what I wanted. 13.2 maybe? What? No, I just was looking at that. <laughs> 6.35 maybe? Maneuver markers are placed on flights after scattering an area of combat. Do not place markers on flights already marked with one. And a flight that begins moving with the maneuver marker must expend half of its MPs, round factions up, fractions up to remove the marker before it expends any other movement points. Okay, so I was right on that. Because now we're gonna go to the Egyptians. They get their movement now because the Israelis just got their free movement because of the uh, bonus. So this guy is just gonna have to like turn around and, and get the hell out. He's gonna use half of his movement, um, which is only three and we round up. So he has to use two movement points to lose the maneuver marker. And then he has one free point to use. And I think what he's gonna do is just like Go here and then turn, was it uh, 60 degrees for free? Now yeah, I'm starting to remember some of this. Actually, he gets, um, well, I don't know if that eats up his movement, but we'll just say 60. So yeah, he gets 60 degrees. So he's gonna go one, two. So he's gonna start turning and trying to get the hell out. Um, now we go back to this guy. He is at medium and he's not engaged yet, so we have to stay on the, the bomb path. 
I wonder if I should have come over here and just done a much shorter route. Um, now you live and learn, right? So you get three movements. We goes one, two, three. Maybe if we get lucky, we'll be able to kind of shoot past this jet. Maybe. <laughs> um, Cause he's not really turned to face us right now. So we might be able to get right around him and hopefully he won't be able to turn too fast and come pursue us. Okay. So we did that phase. So we go back to our sequence of play and we'll go to the random events. Oh, because we did the admin phase. So what will we do in the admin phase? Let's see. We could try to roll to get rid of disordered. So yeah, I guess that's true. Um, this specter could potentially uh, get out of his disordered result because he gets to add, um, I believe, plus one, right? He did lose an aggression because of the combat. So he only gets plus one to his roll. So he's going to have to roll really high too. So essentially, I don't know. I should have put rally hexes in here, honestly. Um, because, yeah, I don't think this is... Because you can't do air-to-air -air combat if you're disordered. Hmm. Well, it doesn't get it. He rolls a 12, um, modified to 13, so it doesn't get that roll. So he won't lose his disordered marker. We know this guy can't ever lose his disordered marker because he, his aggression level is way too low. So that's the admin phase, right? Yeah. We're ready for the new turn, so let's do random events. We roll, what is that, a 15. Mechanical failure, but nobody's damaged or crippled, surprisingly. Uh, so then we just go to the next turn. We go to detection. We'll see if we can detect this flight. And what do we get modifiers? It is no modifiers, so we're good. And technically, he does get a visual he could get a visual ID on him because he is in line of sight. It is two hexes, so he could still get a visual on this guy. Let's see if we get a detection roll. You don't get a detection roll. So visual. No other modifiers. Let's see if we get a visual detection roll on this guy. No. So we don't even see him. We don't detect him. He's just totally lost. Um, let's see if the Egyptians can detect this guy again. Oh, they roll an 18, so they do detect him. He becomes detected. Okay, we've got a movement. The Israelis will opt to move first because they really want to get on this guy. Maybe, be a, well, they can't really do anything. He's going to have to just fly back, I guess, around or fight him. He does get the one. We will be able to do something. So he's going to have to use medium. I believe his speed is... All these charts you got to constantly keep with you. That is kind of annoying too to play solo. So many charts. Um, the Spectre at medium and it's clean. I believe it gets six, right? So it's medium, it's clean, it's at combat, no, it gets four. Oh, wait, and I should have marked off fuel. So that's one thing we should have done in our combat also. We need to tick off a fuel for both the Mirage and the MiG 17 that did it. So. The Mirage only has six fuel points. So we'll go ahead and, and he gets one. And the MiGs have like 12, so they, they, they'll probably never run out. And he's got one. Oh, I'm sorry, no, that's the wrong guy. This thing's got one, okay. So he'll go first, and unfortunately he can't do much. He's gonna just try to turn around and fly back to the airfield, I think is what he's gonna do. He is going to turn once. He's going to go four speed, so he gets a max turn of 120. He's going to go is that way. So he goes 30, 60, 90, 180, or 120, right? That's most we can move is 120. Yeah. And that's one movement point, and then he has three other ones. Oh, he's got to get rid of the maneuver thing, so he has to use two of his... I forgot about that. So he has a maneuver marker. He's going to have to use two of his four available MP. We just used one to turn. So now he has one more left, and he'll go like this. And Hopefully we can just get a rally back and be able to attack this guy. So now we are... So they're still disordered, and he's still at medium. So now we get the Egyptians. They're going to draw a chit. Actually, they both get to move because the Israeli... Automatically moved all these flights. 
Um, let's go ahead and move this guy. So he's still got his thing, but he's just disordered and he's never gonna be able to be not disordered. So let's just fly him back home. He's gonna use his movement of three. Actually, he can go to dash, because now we're pretty much done. He's not going to do anything else. So we're going to move him up to dash uh, throttle. And that means he gets four movement points. So at four movement points, we get a free turn of 120, or a max turn of 120. So we're going to go... But we can just get free turns, too. I don't know why it's been all that time turning. So we'll go one here, and we get a free turn of um, 60 degrees. Right, yeah, so we'll go one, two... That's one point, two points, three points, four points. Boom, he's taken off. And we gotta keep our little markers next to him. So we know he's still at medium and he's bringing it. Um, this guy's gonna move. He gets a movement of three because he's still in combat. We have to stick to our plan that we had here. So he's gonna go one, two, three, he, and then he turns one, two. 60 degrees free turn. Um, yeah, so we did that. Nobody else has used their fuel. We're good there. There's no Sam's, um, the admins. We can actually try to recover from disordered again. So we know that this guy can never do it, but this guy actually can if he rolls a uh, 19 or higher. Nope, not close, but not that not close enough. So he's still disordered. And we move on to the random events phase. Eleven. Delayed attack orders. EF flights may not initiate air to air combats this game turn. Well, that's not a problem for us. Um, we go to detection. This guy's detected. Annie's within two. So let's see if we can get a visual sighting on this guy. I guess he's not in our line of sight though. Our line of sight only extends forward, I believe. Let me double check on that. I don't know if you get line of sight if you use the rear. Line of sight. No. It doesn't seem to be facing forward. So yeah, we get a we get a detection roll on this guy if we can visually detect him. And oh, that could be good enough. I think that's good enough. Visual sighting. It's not far away, not a different altitude, not target and search and haze, and not a multi-aircraft doing it. So yeah, we're good to go. With a visual, yeah, we got it. So we visualize this flight now. So now we know that flight Y will always be this bad boy. Okay, so we did our detection. We're gonna do our movement. The Israelis will go first. Mm. Let's see if they can draw our ship. They get a one movement, so they can actually do what they want. Again, I believe he's at four, right? Because he's a Mirage, which is clean. He's got four, he's gonna get combat. Yeah, I like that. So he's gonna go one, two, he's gonna free turn here and go 30. Yeah, we'll do that. And then go three, four. Yeah, he's just gonna come this way and sort of maybe hopefully get his um, disorder taken care of maybe next turn. Now play passes back to the Egyptians. We'll have this guy go. He's actually going to go. Um, let's go ahead and use a dash throttle because he's just going to. He has to get away. We're just we'll just safe. We'll just pretend that he has to really run away. So with a dash on a Mig, seventeen, and we're going to go ahead and just drop the ordnance because he's not going to be able to do anything. He can't get undisordered. He's kind of effed. So he's going to be a clean value at a medium height is four for dash. So we're going to automatically take off a fuel point later. I'll just go ahead and do that now. And he gets four, so he's just gonna go one, two, three, four. I mean, he's literally just trying to bug the hell out. And then he's gonna try to go back to the airfield. This guy's gonna continue on, so he also gets um, three. We have to stay at the medium speed, because um, we're not doing dash here, we're only doing dash to get out. So we gotta go one, two, three. So he's slowly but surely making his way there. Um, all right. I'm gonna take a break real quick because I need to look up some things. I wanna make sure I get the flak rules right. And we've moved everybody. So actually let's do the, let's do the disordered roll, see if this guy can get rid of his disordered status. Um, he does not. 
And we know this guy can't get rid of his Azorian status, so he's chilling. I guess I could have done, oh, I couldn't have done visual because he wasn't that close, maybe. And it doesn't matter, he's bugging out anyway. So when I come back, we'll finish up the last part of this raid. It's going to be kind of interesting. If the Splite doesn't get out of Disordered status, it will not be able to attack air anyway. And it's already depleted one set of its missiles. This guy's gone on his way in, so maybe we'll see if we can get some damage done with Dribblers if he doesn't get uh, taken out by the Flak here. Uh, okay, so we come back. Part 2 of uh, EV, EV5, or was it Alert 5? EV4, Alert 5. <laughs> That's the scenario. All right.